my story of getting into racing is, is very different to most. I'm actually, when you look at the guys I compete against now in GP3, also in Formula 2, I'm on the older side, being 23, okay. I'm, <laughs> I, th I hope I'm still young, but most people started in, in karts when they were three, four years old. If you look at Max Verstappen, he, he started in go-karts when he was three and four years old. And his mom was a European karting champion, his dad was a, a Formula 1 driver, so he was meant to be a racing driver. My, my story, I mean, I started racing when I was 17 through an introduction mm -hmm. uh, through a friend when I was going to high school. I was applying to colleges. Racing was my dream ever since I could really talk and I loved cars, but getting into, getting into motorsport and, and getting to where I am today was, was definitely a baptism by fire because I, I had no experience when I, when I first started racing. Well, tell me about your successes then because it's been quite a year for you. Obviously, yeah, it's been a, it's been a breakthrough year in 2017. I finished eighth in the GP3 series, which is one of the feeder series to, to Formula One, and came away with three podiums, three separate top fives, and 78 points scored in the championship. So we finished second in the team's championship, and overall it was a, a very strong year, and I'm, I'm really happy and, and proud of, of what we achieved. Um, but looking forward to, to next year. Mm -hmm. my, obviously my plans aren't confirmed yet, but should be very soon, and hopefully we can have an even, even stronger year. Okay, how do you prepare for a race then? Tell me about that. Preparing for a race starts in the weeks before, before the race. And we do a lot of karting, obviously the physical element, your nutrition, your sleep, all those things uh, are key factors for, mm -hmm. for your performance over the weekend. And then the week before we'll do simulator uh, sessions with the team. So all, f all four drivers, we share the simulator and we'll, we'll swap between and that that's also quite competitive and, and sort of gets you going mm -hmm. and gets the, comp the co competition going before, before the race weekend starts. And then when it actually comes to the weekend, we will walk the track, we review your data with, the engineer, with your engineer and really analyze everything to, to be able to, when you get on track, we have very limited tra track time. So when you get on track, you really need to perform straight away. I was speaking to Neil Jani uh, here on Front Seat just a few weeks ago and he was telling me that his kind of uh, sport of choice outside of uh, karting and motor racing is uh, snow skiing and snow hiking because that actually is incredibly good for you in the preparation for, for a race for your physical condition. What's your sport of choice? I'd say my sport of choice, I really love cycling. I do a lot of cycling and, and r some running as well, but I really enjoy squash. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a great sport for hand-eye coordination and also it's very interval based. So I'd say cycling and squash are my two main sports outside of racing and, and karting. All right, so that's the physical side. What about the mental side? How do you prepare for a race mentally? Because I understand that you actually kind of rely on your maths brain when it comes to that side of things. Obviously, because I started when started racing, it's not, it's not a nat it wasn't a natural thing for me. So I had to figure out ways where I could how, how I could learn and apply myself. Mm -hmm. And so when it, when it came to, to moving forward as a driver, the, the key, the big thing I found was studying the data and really analyzing the tracks and watching the video as much as I could in order to, in order to apply that when I got on track. So when it comes to the mental side now, obviously I still do that, but also visualization I think is a key, key aspect for, for any racing driver. So I, I do a lot of visualization before the race weekend and also before the, the session starts on track. And that tied in with the karting and the simulator, I think, are the, are the two uh, sort of biggest mental things you can do to prepare. And what about mind training specifically? Because you work with other uh, driver trainers to kind of hone your mind and get you in that mindset for a race. I think the, for mind training, I, I actually have an app on my phone <laughs> to practice some like reaction stuff. And, and, and some brain games, let's say, mm -hmm. to sort of switch your brain on. And then after that, I think the key, the key thing is the visualization and the meditation. Okay, well, while we're talking about mind training, there is a company that provides around three quarters of the drivers on the F1 starting grid with mental stamina. And they are turning their attentions now not to the racetrack, but to the boardroom as well. This report looks at how CEOs are benefiting from these F1 techniques, and it features someone very close to our guest, Ryan. This is Eric Vetter. 
He's the CEO of UPC, one of Switzerland's leading communications and entertainment companies. He's responsible for 7,000 employees, an annual revenue of over 3 billion francs, and the expectations of almost 7 million customers. There is a fair amount of stress in, in the decisions you make, the risks you take, uh, and uh, I think uh, that's why it's important to uh, find a way to uh, relieve the stress that uh, all of us have as a, a CEO or in any high high-performing uh, role. Five years ago, he turned to an unexpected industry to help his performance. Hinsa has been helping drivers perform their very best under high pressure. Herrick's son, Ryan, a GP driver, introduced him to the program. I was really impressed with the change that it had on Ryan. He was fully confident. He was uh, much more focused. And, and I think uh, what, uh, what Aki's methodology, his philosophy, uh, his program does, it, it focus you, focuses you on uh, what's, uh, what's important. Formula One drivers and CEOs in general have surprisingly many things in common. There's the pressure of having to perform as an individual in an environment that's highly competitive, very complex and often in constant change. By word of mouth, Hinsa's success on the racetrack quickly led to the boardroom. Now they are setting up permanent offices here in Switzerland to deal with demand. By the nature of the job, CEOs can become isolated. They can become uh, lost in the perspective of needing to do more and more and more. And as you go to more senior levels, the risks of burnout become ever higher. And here in Zurich, the rates of so-called burnout are the highest in Switzerland. Every year, it costs the Swiss economy 5.7 billion francs. I'm a much happier person today uh, than I was, uh, you know, four or five years ago. Uh, that's not to say I was unhappy, uh, but I, it's given me more balance. Uh, and uh, I think uh, for that reason, I'm coping with stress in a much better way, uh, and I feel better. Eric is just one of an increasing number of executives benefiting from the training first used with Formula One drivers. With that, they ensure they stay in gear and on the road to success. Well, that was, of course, uh, the UPC uh, CEO, Eric Tvetter. My dad. Your dad. <laughs> how do you feel about kind of introducing him to this whole kind of mind technique and how he's using it in his work? I think it's been, I've certainly noticed a change with my dad after, well, he, he was the one who originally met Aki mm -hmm. and, and introduced me to Hinsa. And that's how I started working with them. But when they started developing the, the CEO program through what they're learning in, in Formula One, I'd say it's made a huge difference in, in how he, yeah, how, like you said, how he copes with stress, how he has happiness, and, and just being a more balanced individual. And I think that's a key part of racing is, is, is the balance mm -hmm. between your physical, not training hard, but not training too much, making sure you're, it's all about energy and, and managing your energy well. So when you, when you come to the track, there's nothing, for you else, there's nothing else for you to think about. You can just focus on, focus um, on your job and focus on driving. What are some of the things that they tell you to do or help you with specifically? Specifically, I mean, we, the three questions Aki asked me during my first meeting with him was, who are you, what is your purpose, and are you in control? So when I speak with my coach, Heike, who was Sebastian Vettel's mm -hmm. uh, performance coach during his four years winning back-to-back winning -back world championships. So Heike is obviously a very <laughs> qualified knows. person. He knows <laughs> what's going on. So we, we, those, those are obviously very deep questions and something you have to take a lot of time to think about. But knowing and learning about yourself and learning the answers to those questions mm -hmm. and, and discussing that really helps you to to, to when it, for when it comes to the, the moment when you have to perform and all that pressure is on you and, and there's a lot going on, situations are changing, it's about to rain, it's mm -hmm. qualifying you have one lap, it, it helps you to let all of that go and just be in the moment. And that's where the, the visualization, the, the switching your mind on with the little app and, and doing, those, doing those small things well and trying to, to become better each, each day in, in, in every training, that's, that's where it all comes together. Okay, well, it's, it's very interesting to see kind of the family connection as well with the racing and the boardroom. Uh, but while we're talking about family, your mum is your manager. 
how does that work? So basically, I mean, we, we came from nothing in racing. My parents didn't know anything about <laughs> racing. I mean, I knew about racing. It was my passion. But it was your dream, but you had no... It was my dream no... and my passion, but I had no way into it because yeah. obviously my, my dad is in the telecommunications industry. My mom used to work. She was the VP of corporate development at United Artists. And, and so they're very in telecommunications, not, <laughs> not racing, which became important because in the end, racing is a business as well. And for, okay, it was a huge learning curve for my parents and for my mom, but my mom has a very, an incredible business sense. And when it, come, when it came to contracts and negotiating with sponsors, she's very switched on and, and was able to learn about the racing stuff. I mean, we, we all learned together. So that's, it's been a huge learning curve, but I, I wouldn't be able to be where I am today without my mom and my dad and, and us working together to, to So you make to quite a success. team yourselves. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Family yeah. better. OK, and, <laughs> I mean, a lot of racers come from a pretty financially secure background. I mean, has that helped you? We're very blessed, but I wouldn't say we have what a lot of other people in racing uh, mm -hmm. are able to do with with their finances and so sponsorship and and getting investors and and finding finding a way to make obviously racing is a is an extremely expensive sport and at the levels below formula one it's up to the driver to be able to to raise the budget and and bring the budget to, to the teams because the, the teams need to operate so that's been a huge challenge but this this past season i've I've gotten the support of, of KFC and, and Pertamina and, and Pepsi, and they've been all so supportive, and I'm, I'm so happy that of, of the success we've had, and I hope we can... And that's down to the business mind and that's, of your and mom. Exactly, and, and that's down yeah. to the business side, because in the end, race, racing is a business, and, mm -hmm. and there is a high return for upside potential for, for sponsors. And as an American driver looking forward, I think that gives me a huge advantage over others, because... Even even getting into Formula One, you need to, to be able to align some sort of corporate corporate backing. Mm -hmm. So we're working on that. And, and now as as the top ranked American driver racing in, in the feeder series to, in Europe, I, th I think that that can come together soon. OK, we'll talk about the future in just a moment. But I wanted to bring up, you know, the fact that you do a lot of charity work as well. You do give back. Yes, I, that's an extremely important thing for, for me, for my mm -hmm. family. My parents always taught me it's not what you have, it's what you give. And this year, or since 2016, I've worked with three different charity partners, the Lessons for Life Foundation, MTV Staying Alive, and Right to Play, which is a huge, which all three are amazing organizations, but Right to Play works with millions of children every month. And, and I think using racing as a platform to help promote them and, and raise money, I've, I've raised over ten, tens of thousands of pounds for, for these charities. So it's, that makes me feel really good. And it's not just about racing, it's also about giving back. Okay, so what does 2018 hold for you then? Well, if, you can, if, you can, <laughs> if you can divulge anything. Nothing's, an, you can... <laughs> nothing's announced yet, but okay. I would say, given that I'm still living in Italy, that's, uh, that's a good enough. And I raced for an Italian team last year. That's a, that's, <laughs> okay, that's a good, that's a good <laughs> sign. Okay, but, but I was kind of meaning, maybe let's say, look a little bit uh, further afield. Um, you would like to kind of be the next, oh, the, the next Formula One American driver. I mean, is that a realistic dream, do you think? I think so. I mean, this year has been, been a huge breakthrough year, and, and I'm working even harder. To, to make the upcoming season even better. My, my target is to win the championship, and mm -hmm. I think that's an absolutely viable target and something I need to, need to achieve in order to get the license points uh, mm -hmm. for, for an F1 super license. And then after that, it's, it's more about aligning the, the corporate side. And obviously, in the end, it's about your performance. And so I just have to keep focused on that, and the other things will fall into place. But it's something you have to keep, to keep in mind to, to be able to to win or finish in the top three in GP3, mm -hmm. and then moving on to Formula 2, finish in the top five, and then I'll have enough super license points to, and just from, to race in Formula 1. And just from what you're saying, I mean, you have a kind of very international background. You're driving for an Italian team. Your father uh, and your family live here in Switzerland, uh, but you also have an American passport. I mean, what's your connection to Switzerland? You were at EPFL, weren't you? Yes, so Switzerland, I went to, I went to boarding school 
for high school because I didn't want to have to change schools again. So <laughs> I'm an only child, and, and my family, we've, we've moved around a fair bit. But for me, New York really is home. And I wanted to, to go somewhere for high school where I wouldn't have to change schools if we moved. Yeah. So halfway through my first year in high school, uh, my dad said, oh, yeah, we're, I'm going to start working in Switzerland. <laughs> so we're going to live in Switzerland now, too. I said, OK, I'm going to stay here. But uh, I came during my school breaks, obviously, and during the summers from when I was 14 years old. So mm -hmm. we've been here for, for almost nine years now. So I love, I love Switzerland. It's an, it's an amazing place. And I'm very lucky to be able to spend a lot of time here. OK, and I just want to pick up on one uh, brilliant story that you told me uh, when we first met, and it's about the fact that the FIA actually gave you your driving licence <laughs> before you could drive on yes, real roads. Yes, that's, that's true. <laughs> so I had a racing licence at, at 17, mm -hmm. which is when I did, had my first race. And in New York State, you couldn't... You had to be 18. Mm -hmm. yeah, you could get your learner's permit, but you had to be 18 in order to get your, your driver's licence, mm -hmm. and it took months to get it. So I, I, didn't, I got my license in February of 2013. But after that, I had already lots of, lots of races under my belt. Uh, yeah. Half a season in Star <laughs> Mazda, my first three races in 2011. So I guess a driving test doesn't seem such a daunting task, <laughs> I guess. No, it was, uh, it was OK. It, it, it went pretty well. The guy, the guy was a bit surprised because I pulled in a slightly different way to get into the parking spot so I could back up and make it straighter. And he was like, what are you doing? And he was like, oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK, and uh, you can, of course, drive on real roads now. What do you drive? I drive a Ford Focus RS in bright blue, which mm -hmm. is my favorite color, as you can see from my helmet. <laughs> yeah. So if you see a bright blue Focus RS driving around Italy or Zurich, that's probably it's me. It's probably <laughs> <you>. OK. <laughs> Making lots of pops and bangs. <laughs> <laughs>